Hi, thank you for having me today. So I am a health psychologist, a little bit different um, training background than some of our other presenters. And I'm gonna be talking to you today about our behavioral approach to treating women with chronic digestive conditions. And um, specifically, I'm gonna focus on irritable bowel syndrome, since this is a highly prevalent condition and something that disproportionately affects women. So I'll talk some about um, the proposed um, sex-based differences in IBS, reasons for those differences, um, and I'll give you a brief overview of some of the behavioral treatment options that we found to be effective for women who have IBS. Um, so just to give you kind of an overview of our program first, so uh, the Behavioral Medicine Service is housed within the Digestive Health Center here at Northwestern Medicine. And um, our mission is to provide individuals suffering from chronic digestive conditions with evidence-based behavioral self-management strategies to improve their actual GI symptoms, their emotional well-being, and their quality of life. And we really try to approach this as a team. And so our program was started by Dr. Lori Kiefer. She's a health psychologist. I head up our clinical service. We have Dr. Brenner, our functional GI specialist, who's a gastroenterologist, also a dietitian. We have a patient liaison that helps with coordinating care. She's training to be a health coach to do more clinical intervention with our patients as well. So in terms of the type of patients we treat in our clinic, um, so we see patients with a variety of digestive illnesses. Um, the bulk of our referrals are patients who have functional GI conditions, and I'll talk uh, in a moment about what, what that means. Um, we also see a, a good portion of patients that have inflammatory bowel disease, so Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, um, and then also a subset of patients that have other chronic digestive conditions like celiac or chronic pan pancreatitis. Uh, so just as a reminder in terms of what is a functional GI condition, so this means there's no structural abnormality that can be identified to explain the symptoms that the patient's experiencing. Um, so the most common type of functional GI disorder we see is irritable bowel syndrome, so I'll be focusing on that today. Uh, but there's also other functional GI conditions that we see and that that do also respond to behavioral treatment. So functional dyspepsia, even functional heartburn symptoms um, can also improve with some behavioral treatment options. Um, and we really believe that part of what's going on with these functional GI conditions is there's a dysregulation between the brain and the gut, and there's some central nervous system uh, processes that influence symptoms, and that's what we're going to be targeting with our treatments. Um, and these are often frustrating conditions for physicians to treat because a lot of our traditional medical interventions are only minimally effective, um, and these are chronic um, conditions, and so um, a lot of times physicians can sort of hit a wall with their treatment options, and so that's why I want to talk today about um, the behavioral approach and how that might um, help in terms of managing these patients. So just a review about what irritable bowel syndrome is. Um, so it's a, you know, we actually do have diagnostic criteria for this. So it's a positive symptom diagnosis. Um, and it's, we really consider it a pain disorder. So it's characterized by chronic abdominal pain that's associated with changes in form or frequency of stool. And often it's improved with having a bowel movement. Um, so we have criteria that have been developed uh, by experts around the world called our Rome 3 diagnostic criteria. Um, and then you can you subtype patients as well. So some patients are diarrhea predominant, some constipation predominant, and then some patients have mixed symptoms that kind of fluctuate between the two. Um, so in addition to those hallmark symptoms, there's also what we call extra intestinal symptoms. So in addition to just the bowel symptoms, um, there can also be a lot of bloating, fatigue, nausea, a lot of urgency. Um, women do seem to have more of these extra intestinal symptoms. They also seem to be more severe in women. Um, and this is all in the absence of any alarm features. So, you know, no rectal bleeding, rapid weight loss, um, or other kind of alarm symptoms that would indicate something more serious may be going on. Um, so in terms of the burden of this disorder, so it is highly prevalent. So um, in terms of the world's population, we're looking at 10 to 20% prevalence rates. Um, 
and it you know, makes up a significant portion of physician office visits, so 12% of primary care physician office visits, um, anywhere from like 30 to 50% of the caseload of a gastroenterologist, um, and it is more prevalent in women, so two to one prevalence rates, uh, women to, to men. Um, there's a lot of, there's high resource utilization with the disorders, so because of these, you know, there's the direct cost with all of the, um, the office visits, so um, on average an IBS patient will have eight to ten physician office visits a year, then there's the medications, and there's all the, you know, the costs associated with the workup that the patients are get, getting, um, and then indirect costs, and so, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, significant quality of life burden from this, and um, impacts patients' ability to function, and so um, it's second to the common cold as accounting for the most w missed work days. Um, so there's that kind of uh, financial impact as well. Um, and then also I think it's important to note that it can result in unnecessary surgeries. So again, because these patients have these chronic symptoms, they're difficult to, to treat, they get bounced between specialists, and there's a heart, ends up being a higher rate of hysterectomies among women with IBS than um, control patients. In terms of the quality of life burden, so um, it's actually significant and comparable to other chronic health conditions. So um, the quality of life impact is similar to someone who has diabetes, depression, chronic kidney disease. Um, this slide here um, illustrates the specific domains in which patients' quality of life is affected. So. Um, this is an IBS specific measure, and as you can see, so there's a lot of like interpersonal um, relationship burden here. So there's a lot of stigma, embarrassment around unpredictable bowel symptoms. So what happens is women start um, restricting um, and shaping their lives around these symptoms. So they're not taking the L anymore. They don't want to travel as much anymore. Um, you know, they don't want to go out to eat with friends. Um, so they. So you see their, their social relationships being impacted, intimacy um, is affected, as well as just the emotional distress um, and just kind of overall worry about their health. So in terms of conceptualizing this, we really come at it with a from a biopsychosocial framework and find that to be most helpful. Um, so it isn't simply a stress disorder. Um, there does seem to be a true biological component. We don't have um, a full grasp of what that is, but um, you know, researchers believe that you know, some, some, some biological factors that may play a role are um, you know, alterations in gut flora, maybe central nervous system dysregulation, uh, visceral hypersensitivity. And then we combine that with some early life experiences and then certain cognitive affective processes like you know, certain types of anxiety, hypervigilance around symptoms, and then social factors. And um, all these complex sort of pieces interact and contribute to um, the continuation of the disorder over time. And so we really think of it as a brain-gut disorder. So um, you know, a couple of the features that I think are important to highlight are one, this idea of visceral hypersensitivity. And so researchers have found that if you create kind of pressure in the intestines, the rectum of women um, who have IBS, they experience pain at much lower thresholds than healthy individuals. And so those nerves are just kind of over-firing in the gut. And then you couple that with anxiety over symptoms, and you can see how that creates kind of this kind of combination of patients kind of being on high alert, um, kind of over, over responsive to these very painful symptoms. Um, and then there's this central pain amplification. So studies also show that certain parts of the brain that help down-regulate pain signals from the body are not being activated in patients with IBS. Um, so because there is this uh, brain-gut connection, um, you'll see later why it makes sense that we're really addressing this from a psychological approach because a lot of the medications are really just targeting the gut specifically um, and, it, and, they, and they don't get at uh, the central nervous system component. Um, so in terms of how this relates to women specifically, so again, there's a much higher prevalence rate in women, and um, there's also a difference in the symptom profile. So if you're a woman, you're more likely to have constipation-predominant symptoms. Um, symptom profile also seems to be a bit more severe among women. Um, 
And we don't know exactly what accounts for these differences, but some hypotheses are that uh, there's some um, biological sex differences as well as some sociocultural factors as well. Um, so in terms of the biological piece, we do think there's hormonal factors that influence uh, women's symptoms, experience of symptoms. Um, so certainly, um, you know, we see altered GI motility during pregnancy, during certain phases of the menstrual cycle. Um, so we do believe hormones are playing a role in that. Um, most common age of onset for the condition is late teens to early 40s, so this is women's reproductive years. Um, and so again, speaks to a hormonal component there. Um, and then also, um, so even women who don't IB have IBS report changes in GI functioning around their menstrual cycle, and those rates are even higher among women who have IBS. Um, there's also been some studies to show that there's increased pain sensitivity in the gut among women who have IBS around their menstrual cycle. And there are also uh, maybe some differences in central processing of pain signals between women and men, and so that could also predispose women to have this uh, condition. Um, some studies have found that certain serotonergic agents, so treatments for IBS, are more effective in women, not effective in men, so again, speaks to some biological differences there. Um, and in terms of the sociocultural factors, um, so we know women are higher health care utilizers, and so part of this may be just that women are more likely to be presenting with these symptoms and reporting them um, to their physicians. Um, there also is more stigma around this for women, around these symptoms for women, um, which can create more kind of stress and anxiety around the symptoms, which may be also playing a role. Um, we know that women, there's greater pain catastrophizing, so sort of more um, kind of rumination and um, uh, a sense of helplessness around pain symptoms that also could be playing a role. Um, and then abuse history. So um, interestingly, um, there does seem to be a higher rate of early life adversity or history of abuse in women who have IBS. So up to 31% of IBS patients report an abuse history. And so this could be something that predisposes women to the development of IBS in terms of you know, influencing the development of the gut's nervous system, um, influencing you know, certain psychological processes, coping mechanisms that may play a role in perpetuating these symptoms. Um, so as I mentioned, a lot of our conventional medical interventions are really inadequate for treating the full spectrum of IBS symptoms. So, you know, someone with constipation, you can give them a laxative, but, you know, that's not going to do anything for their bloating. In fact, it might make their bloating worse, um, might not do anything for, um, you know, some of their um, other symptoms that accompany this. Um, and then also, you know, these, a lot of these patients, you know, they have a highly sensitive gut. Well, they're also sensitive to some of the side effects of these medications as well. Um, and so we sort of run out of options when we're just looking at these um, traditional medical interventions, you know, especially with the patients that have more kind of moderate to severe symptoms. And so if we look back at this biopsychosocial model, you can see that it really sort of sets the stage for the use of behavioral treatments. Um, and so the things that we're targeting with our, with our behavioral treatments are, um, you know, this brain-gut dysregulation, this, these differences in central nervous system processing of, of symptoms, um, and some of the cognitive affective processes that we feel are playing a role in the condition. So in our clinic, our approach to treating women with IBS um, is to use evidence-based behavioral treatments. And so the two treatments I offer are gut-directed hypnosis and cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, it's important to note that you know, these treatments were really targeting the IBS symptoms themselves. And so um, we're looking at medical symptom management, um, not necessarily treating the anxiety that might be worsening the symptoms, although that often happens as well. We're really looking at symptom improvement as our outcome. Um, so these treatments help to target the hyperarousal, stress sensitivity that we believe is playing a role, obsessive catastrophic thoughts about uh, symptoms, um, and the kind of hypervigilance around, um, around these, these unpredictable symptoms. And so I think what's really unique about our clinic is this is really considered standard of care for treating IBS. And so patients come in to see one of our GI specialists, and this is given to them as an option. So you could have medications, you could see our behavioral psychologist. Um, this is a meta-analysis showing that, um, you know, psychological treatments are considered effective interventions for IBS with at least 50% reduction in symptoms for patients. 
Um, and again, just in terms of efficacy, so number needed to treat for CBT is three, number needed to treat for gut-directed hypnosis is two. You compare to that to some of the medication options we have, where the number needed to treat is more like seven to 10. And so we really do have good outcomes with these treatments. Um, they're durable, so you follow up patients four to five years after treatment, and they're still experiencing benefits from them. Um, in terms of future directions, you know, we still need more research to understand the sex differences between um, that, that to, to explain the sex differences in IBS. Um, you know, honestly, we have a lot of women in our studies, so we really need more men to be able to examine these differences. Um, and we need to also better understand the influence of hormones and the menstrual cycle on uh, the condition. In terms of take-home points, um, you know, IBS is a highly prevalent condition, disproportionately affects women. We believe it's a disorder of brain-gut dysregulation. Evidence-based behavioral treatments are um, viable options for women with IBS, and these treatments are targeting symptoms, not a psychological disorder. They're short-term treatments, and they're skills-based. And my last point, um, you know, address this with your patients early on. Don't let irritable bowel become vindictive bowel. Um, so it's okay to ask about stress. It's okay to talk about psychological interventions early on before things get out of hand. <laughs>